from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Okay, we're going to start. Let's give people a couple of minutes to find the room. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Library of Congress. My name is Talia Guzman Gonzalez, and I am a reference librarian in the Hispanic Division. Uh, on behalf of the Hispanic Division, our, our co sponsors, the Music Division and the Hispanic Cultural Society, it is my immense pleasure to welcome three outstanding musicians. Eva and I have been working on this event for a couple of months now, so it's very exciting to finally see it you know, come to fruition. Um, we have here with us Adonis Gonzalez, Junior Terry, and Josvani Terry, three highly accomplished musicians that will be talking about sounds and rhythms of Cuban music and their careers as musicians and educators in the United States. I will talk a little bit about them um, in a little bit. I want to say something first about our collections at the library. We have a small display in the back that you're welcome to browse. They're books from the general collection, so please uh, take a look at them. The library has been collecting Cuban material since the mid-19th century, and we have probably the largest collection um, here in the, in the US. Um, the Hispanic Division is the gateway to explore those collections, but it is in every format across the library including, obviously, um, music. Some resources that you can use to explore those collections are come from the work of the Hispanic Division. One of them is the Handbook of Latin American Studies, edited in the Hispanic Division, and also the Archive of Hispanic Literature and Tape, which has recorded nearly 30 authors, Cuban authors, reading from their work. Um, the American Folklife Center, also recorded Cuban music and culture from the 1920s onward. And there you can find a set of long playing records uh, titled Musica de los Cultos Africanos, published in Havana and compiled by the great anthropologist Lydia Cabrera. I could go on and on about our resources and I hope you come to the division and learn about them with us, but you're here to hear our three guests today. So I will introduce them in this order, starting with Adonis Gonzalez. Uh, Adonis is a pianist and composer, and he's a graduate from the Instituto Superior de Arte from La Habana, and holds a Master's of Music degree from the University of Southern Mississippi, and a doctorate degree in piano performance from Rutgers University. He has performed as a soloist with many orchestras around the world, including the Stuttgart Radio Symphony Orchestra in Germany, the National Philharmonic of Venezuela, the Masterworks Festival Orchestra in Washington, D.C., the Cuban National Symphony, and the New York City Opera Orchestra, among many, many, many others. As a composer, Adonis has collaborated with the Works and Process series at the prestigious Guggenheim Museum in New York City, and his symphonic poem for piano and orchestra, Cimarron, was premiered by the National Symphony of Costa Rica. He was a composer uh, in residence of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund and is currently an artist in residence um, of the Cuban Artist Fund in New York and a professor of music at Alabama State University. Adonis has a long list of impressive collaborations, including legendary artists such as mezzo-soprano Denise Graves, violinist Arnold Steinhardt, and also with clarinetist saxophonist Paquito de Rivera. Gonzalez won the first prize of the Teresa Carreño International Piano Competition in Caracas, Venezuela, and the first prize of the most important Cuba piano competition organized by the National Association of Cuban Writers and Artists. He is also a laureate of the International Piano Competition of the Principality of Andorra and the Ernesto Lecuona International Competition of Havana. Adonis is a Latin Grammy nominee in the category of Best Classical Album for his solo debut, Adios a Cuba. Our second guest, Junior Terry, um, uh, is a clinical assistant professor of music at New York University School of Music. He is a graduate of the National School of Art in Havana, Cuba, with a double major in violin and bass. And he holds a bachelor's degree from Cal Arts and a master's from Rutgers University. 
While in Cuba, he performed and toured with the Havana Symphony as a violinist. Junior Terry is an Arara practitioner and a cultural bearer of the African rhythms, chants, and ceremonies that originated in the African kingdom of Dahomey. He continues to research these and other African diaspora-based musical and cultural traditions. In the United States, Junior Terry has studied under Charlie Hayden, Derek Oles, Peter Rowe from the Los Angeles Philharmonic, Potter Smith, Alfonso Johnson, and Kenny Davis. Since moving to New York, he has deepened his understanding of jazz traditions through performing with Steve Coleman, Jerry Gonzalez, and the Fort Apache Band, Jeff Watts, Daphne Prieto, Eddie Palmieri, Gonzalo Ruacaba, Michelle Roseman, Andy Narrow, Ravi Coltrane, and Giovanni Terry, his brother. <laughs> he was part of the Latin Jazz All-Stars project with Dave Valentin, Giovanni Hidalgo, Ilton Ruiz, and Steve Turr and Mario Rivera. Prior to joining NYU, Cabrera taught master classes and workshops uh, around the world. Josvani Terry is an internationally acclaimed composer, saxophonist, percussionist, band leader, educator, and cultural bearer of the Afro-Cuban tradition. In Cuba, he studied at the prestigious National School of the Arts in La Habana and the Amadeo Roldan Conservatory. He has performed with major figures in every realm of Cuban music, including celebrated Novatrova singer Silvio Rodriguez, pianist Chucho Valdez, and Frank Emilio and Don Pancho y los Terri, the band led by his uh, father, violinist and checkered master Eladio Don Pancho Terri Gonzalez. Since arriving in New York, Terry has collaborated with many important figures in the jazz and contemporary music community, playing along Branford Marsalis, Rufus Reed, Dave Douglas, Steve Coleman, Roy Hargrove, and many others. In 2015, Terry was named a recipient of the prestigious Doris Duke Artist Award and was hired by Harvard University as Director of Jazz Ensembles and Senior Lecturer of Music. He has received recent commissions from the San Francisco Yerba Buena uh, Garden Festival, the French American Jazz Exchange, with support from the Mid-Atlantic Arts Foundation and the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation. His album, New Throne King, which features music based on cantos and rhythms of the Arara people of the western Cuba province of Matanzas, was nominated for a 2014 Grammy Award. His previous album from 2012, Today's Opinion, was selected as one of the top 10 albums of the year by the New York Times. And last but not least is my colleague, Eva Reyes Cisnero, who is here, and you don't know that she's also a musician. Maybe you do, but maybe you don't. Um, Eva is my dear friend, colleague, and partner in organizing this bembe for you all. She was born in Cuba, and like our guest, is a classically trained musician. She studied guitar performance at the Escuela Profesional de Música in Camagüey, and musicology at the Instituto Superior de Arte in La Habana. In the US, she received a bachelor's in guitar's performance from Florida International University, and she did her graduate work in Latin American and Caribbean studies with a certificate in Cuban and Cuban American studies. Prior to coming to DC, she worked at the University of Miami Libraries and the Florida International University Library. Today, she is a librarian in the Iberia Rio section of the Africa, Latin American, and Western European Division at the Library of Congress. Eva will lead this first part of the conversation with some questions for our guests. Then we're going to open the floor for your questions uh, to them. And maybe we'll get to listen something. I don't know. We'll see. So join me in welcoming our guests to the library. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. And thank you, yeah. the three of you. Oh, it's not. It's an, it's can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, let me say that again. Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here today, and thank you to our guests for uh, oh my God for coming. It's a pleasure. <laughs> this is a long is a long time friendship, like a family, extended family, more than three decades of studying together, going to school together, um, growing together. Um, so I have a few questions for them, and. Um, to allow you to know them better. And I'm going to start using Just Bunny first. Um, you're Just Bunny, in a video about your visit to Cuba uh, with the Harvard Jazz Ensemble, we hear your mom, who was a nurse, 
before, saying that when you were little, she wanted you to be a doctor because you were so serious. <laughs> uh, instead, you chose to be a musician like your father. The same is true for your brother, Junior, um, also for the three of you. To me, the association of being serious with medicine is very interesting since you are training, as this is true, is a living testament that studying music is a serious business. Can you talk a bit about your schooling in Cuba? How did it prepare you for continuing your ed musical education in the US and succeed professionally as musicians, composers, and also educators? I'm passing yeah. the gonna, microphone the, to you. Uh, the microphone. <laughs> Who wants to start? Who going to start? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, music is serious, as, <laughs> as we all know, and it's a, it's such a rigorous uh, discipline, I would say. Uh, but I believe from my mother, since uh, my father was the founder of the Orquesta Maravilla de Florida, which is one of the uh, more important uh, charanga orchestras in the interior, uh, and she saw how, how much sacrifice he put in behind his, his craft with the orchestra. And besides, because since she was a nurse, you know, this, uh, specialized in pediatrics, she has different ambitions for us. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but unpredictably, we all decided for music. Mm -hmm. And, you know, music uh, uh, plays such an important role in the house growing up. And also, um, it was one of the biggest sources of inspiration because every time that my father would play in town and we would go to his performances, that was clearly that that's what we wanted to be. So, uh, but my father was was really adamant in in instilling in us uh, the disciplines and the rigorous work that was behind music, and that's why. Uh, at the beginning, he was supposed for us to be musicians, but then after we showed that we, we were serious about it, then that was the end of playing with friends on the weekend. <laughs> so um, yes, you know, because of that uh, incredible uh, role model that we have at home, we had at home, we went through all of the uh, conservatories, the studies as, as, as uh, Tatalia read before. And um, yes, for me, it's like music is an art in general. It's a series of any discipline, as we know. Uh, and the time, the dedication, the discipline that goes behind it, the, the, the incredible work that most people don't see when they see you performing on stage uh, is a testament of like how hard <coughs> musicians have to work to polish and develop, develop their craft. Um, so, just because of that, uh, I would say, and because of the hard work that we put uh, behind all the time, we have been able to to keep growing. And this is something that doesn't finish. It's like we still today we are just working mm -hmm. as hard as we were working before, in order to keep growing and to keep doing different things. Uh, and I think it's this hard work also that has help us to join a bigger community, which is the community uh, of New York and the, and the community of, uh, where we live now, uh, also has, has, a, has uh, I would say, allow us to join the, the big uh, educator community, which is something that we believed before, uh, before living in Cuba, and even uh, at the time we were living in Cuba. So um, I hope this answers the question. I don't know if I, it was a long question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let me give it a chance to Adonis as well. And talk, sorry, if you can comment a little bit more about the, the school of art system, well, the island, yeah, that makes the, it different. Too. Absolutely. The, the music edu education in Cuba is very well organized that you have to uh, study certain instruments at a certain age. So I wanted to mm -hmm. I wanted to play the piano, but I didn't know what I was getting into, actually. <laughs> and uh, because piano and violin, you start earlier than other instruments, like uh, from the third grade on, when all my cousins were having fun, I had to put some hours. And my mom was very strict about that, and I'm very grateful because of that. 
but uh, that discipline, you know, carry on all through your life, and it does just expanding on what he was saying. That has helped me. Has helped me to keep growing as I became a professional, so to speak. But um, I also wanted to say that there is a similarity between being a doctor and a musician because I know the doctor has to con constantly be updating. Mm -hmm. So we have to do exactly the same. This never ends, like mm -hmm. Giovanni said. But it's a great thing. It's a, especially when you later on have the opportunity to teach. It's a you, you you are teaching, but at the same time you are learning, mm -hmm. so it's so enriching for our, our lives as, as musicians and as human beings as well. Mm. What about you, Junior? I have a microphone here. Oh, oh okay. okay. You can use this one. Because it was stereo. Yeah. <laughs> no. Hello, everyone. Uh, I just want to add a little bit of what they said. Um, uh, yes, we have a, the in Cuba the system is like a conservatory based on the Russian standards, so. Like a certain instrument, as I said, violin, piano, cello, dancers, uh, like a ballet dancer who started at seven years old. So other instruments like the saxophone, percussion start when you're like a, um, 10, on 11. 10, 11, when you're mm -hmm. already in, in fifth grade. Mm -hmm. So for us, we had to make a decision really quick. Uh, actually, I didn't, I knew from the start that I was going to be a that I wanted to be a musician and a violinist because my father plays a violin. And that was really important for us growing up um, that we already knew somehow, like I, I already, my mom has a like, story of me already saving the soap to go because it's a boarding school. So you have to be in a boarding school. So I was saving soap when I was five years old. This is gonna be for when I go <laughs> at the boarding school. And um, all the other kids I remember she always said that all the other kids were like crying or their parents were crying because imagine taking your kid at seven years old to a school and don't see, only see him in the weekends from Sundays to Friday. And on Friday you come back home and you go back again on Sunday night. So a lot of moms came like in the middle of the week and they were crying and bring sandwiches and stuff. And I said to her, don't come, I'm good here. <laughs> and, uh, I'm enjoying it here. Um, but uh, yeah. Um, so based on in that in in that system, we had a our first teacher was Russian. I don't know for you guys. Oh, yeah. My first teacher was a Russian, Leonid Kontarovich, and um, I just remember that we couldn't understand a word he said, and <laughs> we had a translator, and uh, all of us came out of the room crying because the translator over was uh, brought napkins for us. Like, oh, you going? Okay, take your napkin. <laughs> He couldn't talk, and, but uh, he wanted to say so much, you know, and be so specific about the technique that at a certain time, he, you know, was too much, and he kind of was kind of hitting it like this, <laughs> tap, but, tap, like <laughs> something, the finger, no, raise, don't raise your finger, da, da, da. But um, he was really, he, he, like, he uh, provided a really strong foundation for all of us. And um, since we grew up in Cuba, you know, a lot of the, books, a lot of the information was, you know, Russian information and the technique, the, the way of uh, approaching the music uh, was from Russian, either directly from Russian or some of the professors that went and studied in Moscow. Uh, that was like a, one thing you look forward to, to like be really good to get a, a, a scholarship to study in Moscow. Um, so that was something to look forward at that time. Now I don't know anymore. But, uh, <laughs> um, so. Based on that, um, I just wanted to add a little bit about the, the education because that's something that maybe wasn't clear because here it's completely different. Um, I've been here in the system here. I, I did my bachelor in California. And when I came in, the, the, the levels are completely different here. The, the levels of uh, knowledge of the students is completely different. In Cuba, you sort of, you could track, like everybody sort of have the same level because studying like at the same route, every, you know. Here you maybe have like a private uh, teacher or something. When you get to school, you have a, you know, you arrive and maybe you, you know selfish, maybe you don't even know any selfish, maybe you know a little bit about the rhythms. You know, it's a completely different way of uh, studying here. Um, I don't know where I'm going. I could say many things. <laughs> but um, yeah, the, I also wanted to add that for me it has been like a, like a full circle because of what you said about the, the Russian teachers. My theory teachers and my piano teachers from early on were all Russians. 
I, I did understand them, but I'm a fan of the accent. <laughs> so now I'm on the other side. <laughs> they say, what about the other talent? We know what you're saying, but your accent is so different. So uh, it's, it's, it's kind of like the same thing. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. <laughs> that is great um, that you're bringing those uh, stories right now, because part of that I forgot. <laughs> um, it's also valid to mention that in, in the School of Art, um, that system that is a boarding school, is not only the music students living in, it's all dancers, uh, but classical ballet students, the fine the arts, painters, yeah. um, later on the, the actors and actresses join the, the, the school. So you can, basically you build a family that is going to continue with you. It's not just like you can track the students that everyone at that year are going to be playing something the same at the same level, but it's also you can track the group of the family. You go back three decades. So mm -hmm. You say, we play together in a certain place, so it's very interesting. I'm finishing with that. Let me just move on to something that is very important because part of what you're doing right now. And there is a long tradition of musical exchange between Cuba and the United States. Starting in the 19th century with, uh, for example, the Louis Moreau, the Goldschild. Um, uh, even through the frequency of the social exchange, it was many times dictated for a long time, especially during the 20th century. I have been dictated by the political climate between the two countries. During your years as a music student in Cuba, could you mention any musician uh, from the United States that inspired you, that you were looking forward to play with, that you were trying mm -hmm. to copy in the style of uh, the performance, that you were uh, imagining at a certain point that you would come to the US uh, and, and study here because you were listening to them in Cuba mm -hmm. and there was kind of like a goal to go to. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, well, saxophone is different than piano and violin because it's like the, the, the saxophone school was developed in France. So all of the saxophone teacher, at least, they, that's the information that they had. There was a, you know, the strong French school. But uh, looking up to American artists, uh, yes, uh, something that happened to me at, at the age of 13, 14 years old, I discovered jazz. Uh, and jazz, became for me an obsession. Uh, it was an obsession, but at the same time, I love classical music for sure. So um, you have to really uh, work harder in order to practice both. But yes, yeah, some of the uh, biggest inspiration for me from the US came from the jazz canon, looking up to uh, Miles Davis, to John Coltrane, mm -hmm. Charlie Parker, Thelonious Monk, Brad Powell, um, Sonny Rollins, uh, Clifford Brown, I mean, the list is on and on, which is basically uh, the, the, the biggest contributors, contributors to this musical tradition. So, yes, I remember growing up and finding what jazz was about and then finding radio stations and then uh, there were two radio stations that broadcast jazz in Cuba. So that became, uh, we knew exactly when the jazz shows started, so uh, uh, they had a really wide uh, programming, I would say, going from, you know, the 40s all the way to the most contemporary art, you know, parts of jazz, uh, including Ornette Coleman and everything that was happening with what then was called new music. So that's, in my, in my, in my experience, you know, the biggest influence that I received from from jazz, but at the same time, I, I something I noticed that there was always a collaboration between Cuban and American artists. Not only going back to Chano Pozo, which was like the you know between Chano Pozo, this Leslie Mario Bausa, they were the architects of what is called uh, Afro-Cuban jazz. Uh, but also even going back in history. You know, when there were the, the exchanges in the Circle Caribbean between bands from Cuba that would interpret and some that would visit New Orleans, would visit Mexico and Haiti, and there, there was a lot of exchange in the Caribbean. So um, it's, 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 it's always been a great exchange between Cuba, the US, and the Circle Caribbean. Mm -hmm. I want to say something? Uh, honestly, because uh, of the times when I was a student, we didn't have that much exchange of American classical musicians going mm -hmm, to Cuba. Mm -hmm. So for me, it wasn't an inspiration at the time. 
uh, I did uh, have the opportunity to see many uh, American artists at the jazz festival in Cuba, mm -hmm. like D.C. Gillespie, and I remember when I saw Carmen Marray, I was really <laughs> much Oh, too. yes. Totally. <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, unfortunately, not even the recordings of the first great stars of the American pianistic tradition, mm -hmm. like Van Clive or Susan Starr, we didn't get any of that. We got a whole bunch of Russian recordings because mm -hmm. also at the, the culture was at the time. But I do want to mention that before that happened, a century before that, there was a uh, Gottschalk, and he was constantly in Cuba. I think it was like his backyard. He went there, he, he toured the whole island, and I did the research on him and, and music for piano, and I considered him, even though he was born in the United States, the first Afro-Cuban musician. Mm -hmm. He wrote more, probably more, almost more Cuban dances than any of the other composers. He was a specialist of all the music from the Caribbean, they call, it, they call that kind of music Caribbean rhythms. And in his symphony, one of his symphonies that is called A Night in the Tropics, he was the first to dare to bring a group of black musicians playing their drums so and mixing yeah. with classical music. That had not been done. The, the, the um, popular music of Cuba was influenced by the country dance and all the European dances, but it had its, it had its place. It was at the ballroom, but not in the concert hall. Mm -hmm. So the first one that dared mm -hmm. to do that was him, and then after that, well, we got Le Puna, we got yeah. many other people mm -hmm. doing the, the, what we call today crossover. Mm -hmm. But uh, that the exchange of culture and traditions between the Americans and the Cubans caused a long time even before mm -hmm. the, the jazz started mm -hmm. doing the, the same thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I just, yeah, I, ju I would just want to add a little bit of what you were saying, that Gottschalk was really ahead of his time, because he was really traveling and picking up information and traditions from different places and including in his music. And uh, even the titles and in Spanish and everything. So it's like a really important uh, composer and actually influence at the time what was you know, uh, Cervantes influenced, uh, Jose White influenced, Lequona influenced, Salmel. He met at the time Espadero, mm -hmm. but uh, he influenced, he, was, he had uh, like a, this uh, palette of rhythms that he was just compiling and that was able to put in his music. And, and so he was really ahead of his time. So let's just keep it as a Cuban. <laughs> <laughs> He spoke the language, he knew the culture. Yeah, he, yeah, yeah. Even the, the, the cocuye, which is a very um, a specific a specific thing in Santiago de Cuba mm -hmm. that not many people know. He wrote one of the biggest fantasies for piano uh, based on the rhythms of that. And brought musicians to Havana from Santiago yeah, and did one of the biggest concerts. Uh, and uh, he put one of the biggest concerts at the time uh, with a, a amount of musicians. Absolutely. Never happened before. Um, I would say that I. I came, I'm younger than him, with brothers. So he was already listening to jazz and I, he got me into it. Uh, I was uh, first started with the violin and after that I switched to bass because somehow he was playing the piano. He was like, oh, can you find the notes on the bass? And somehow, little by little I started. And after that I went to school and really studied it. But um, I, there were some recordings of artists that uh, we grew up listening to, like Coltrane, as he would say, but also some more Contemporary like Branford Marsalis, Jeff Tain Watts, Charlie Hayden that we got, we, we, uh, uh, that we've been here and since we've been here we've been able to work with them, and that's been really a, 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 an experience for us and an honor actually to be able to be friends with them and actually to work with them. I was able to study with Charlie Hayden as I said earlier, which I listened to it as you know as a kid and I just didn't never imagine in my life that I would would be able to study with him. And um, with Jeff Tain Watts, one of the living legends, drummers this day, that I never imagined to be working with him and to be, you know, to call a friend, you know. So that's, it's been really an, an amazing experience for us. And it's something that, uh, yeah, we both always keep, uh, uh, one time I was in a tour with Tain, that's an, an interesting story. One time I was in a tour with Tain and we went in Europe and, um, I felt, you know, when I, I started working with him, we had a couple of drinks at the time, and uh, I asked him, why did you call me? 
because there's a lot of other bases, young bases, anybody from here that already grew up playing jazz. And he said, because you have something different. You have something interesting that is different. You have another way of looking at it. And that uh, brought, uh, opened the gate for me to be even more wild because <laughs> now I knew he was really uh, interested in um, on me not really imitating what the, the recording that I had to play. Well, I just I could be more myself. And that was something that was a, some kind of illumination for me to to appreciate and to be even deepen my, my knowledge and my roots even more because I know that's something that he's interested about and that's the same thing that I'm interested in about him. He's interested to learn from me and I'm interested to learn from him and that's how we both keep growing, right? So that was uh, an experience. Growing, <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> and talking a lot about Cuban music and the, the influence of the American <clears throat> music in, in Cuba or vice versa. Uh, I would like to, for maybe people that are not so familiar with the Cuban music roots, if you could um, explain, if we're going to dissect the Cuban musical landscape, mm -hmm. what, are, what is made out of, what is the foundation of that? What we call Cuban music, for some people, could be a stereotype of the conga, conga line, or Carmen Miranda. Ricky for Ricardo. Some, Ricky Ricardo. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But the Cuban music is, is, is a lot of different things. And what are the roots of that music? What is the musical landscape made of? Mm. If you could dissect that. Do you want to start? You want to start? I'll say something. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, um, obviously, starting with the mixing of the European traditions and African traditions. But not only from the things that were happening in Cuba, but the things that were happening in the Caribbean in general. So mm. um, are the, what we call the cinquillo is something that sounds very Haitian to me. It sounds like from Haiti. Mm -hmm. And uh, just before he expand, our, our, our <coughs> musical root is like a rainbow. We have French influence. We have Chinese influence. No, it's not only the Spanish and the uh, African tradition. The, there is English even because the country dance was a, what, what, what yeah. became for us at the, at the, the first national kind of dance that we call it the contra danza, came from the country dance that was something that was danced uh, in, in England. And then it went to France and changed name to Country dance, dance. like we, the games. One was country, but that he got lost in translation, <laughs> so we came to games. And then I guess in Cuba, got again, the translation got to contra dancer. Uh, <laughs> so it's a mixture of so many things, but I will let just one expand that. Elizabeth? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The spanning on that is all of that, plus a lot of uh, different traditions from West Africa. Uh, it's not just anywhere in Africa. Uh, we're talking about West Africa, we're talking about uh, Yoruba tradition, we're uh, talking about other tradition from Dahomey, we're talking about tradition that came uh, also from the Congo. Uh, uh, so we, it's a vast area that, uh, that uh, among, you know, uh, account for a lot of different tradition and how all those traditions at one time, they had to coincide in one place in Cuba and kind of melt because there's a lot of things that in Cuba you see that in Africa is they are separate. You know, if you are from Oyo, you just practice. You know, one Orisha. You are from um, from a, a certain Ile Ife. You practice just one Orisha in Cuba. They all had to co uh, coexist in one place, and they had to kind of uh, bring it. Uh, uh, bring all the traditions together and, you know, sort of form this uh, big uh, palette of, 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 of freedoms and knowledge and, and traditions that, that that's what we, we have in our music. Yeah. No, and also, I, I will add, because it's a, most have been said, that um, for you to have an idea, Cuba as an island is a big island, so sometimes you could be traveling from the east, from the most western side of it, Cuba, to the most eastern side, and there are traditions that these people they don't know mm -hmm. that are practicing the other side mm -hmm. of that. Right? Mm -hmm. um, 
there's a lot of musical tradition, I mean, a lot of tradition practice in Santiago de Cuba that are different than the one practiced in my province, Camagüey, that has nothing to do with the, what practice in Matanzas, and then Pinal del Rio in Havana. There are different set of drums played in different places, different chants. There are, even from Spain, there are like influences from different sides of Spain in different parts of the island. Uh, like Eva said, we cannot just say Spain, but we have to open it to uh, to a lot of different uh, countries, even from the northern, from Morocco, there were influences in Cuba too. Uh, so it's, it's like a huge, huge hybrid that somewhere, somehow, found a way to, to create an identity that at the same time defines Cuban music. For us, even for us, it's really hard to define what Cuban music is. Uh, but, and also at the same time happened something which is really interesting, and it's like the Caribbean being one of the centers in which a lot of places, a, a lot of countries from the world came, uh, turned the, the Caribbean into like something which, uh, for me, which is it's like big, at some point became like the center of the universe. And it was interesting when there was a, yeah, yeah, and I, I, I'm, I'm going to explain why. There was an, an uh, an exhibition in New York uh, four years ago that was about Caribbean art. And this, instru- this uh, exhibition, you know, was like in different museums uh, 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 across New York, in the Studio Museum in Harlem, in the, um, the Museum in El Barrio, and there was another museum in, in, in Queens that I'm forgetting the name. You could go to the museum and they, and the, the curator of the exhibition, were really smart because they selected uh, pieces uh, from artists from the 1700s, 1800s, 1900s, up, up to the present. So when you would visit that exhibition, it was really hard to define or to accept that this is a Caribbean artist. It looks like it could be a French artist. It looks like it could, it could be a, a, a Velasco. It could be a Rubens, uh, um, it could be any artist. So after I visited that exhibition, for me it was a big revelation because even though, even though we were born in places that we're, we, you can, you can uh, I mean, transpire history by just seeing an, an, a building that was building, built in the 1600s, uh, but at the same time, you really understand the centrality of this geography for the culture of the world. And you really understand how how hard it is to define what the Caribbean is, what Cuban is. Because, it def- I mean, the concept of the art, the concept of the music, defies any, any, any given concept that you could have of a geography. So a, a Caribbean artist from, this, from the 1700s, it could be a European artist, could be a Chinese artist, could be a, an artist from anywhere in the world. So that's, and you can see that nowadays, you can see that through the music, you can see that through the visual art, through the films, you can see through, I mean, most of the art forms. Yeah. I just want I just want to add also that uh, when we talk about Cuban music, especially now, there is a a mixture of purity and impurity in terms of African music. In many other countries where the slaves were brought, their traditions faded. Mm-hmm. In Cuba, somehow it managed to be disguised, especially the the, mm-hmm. the religious traditions. Uh, they because they were allowed to certain days do what they celebrated in Africa, but using the saints that the Europeans wanted them to worship. Yeah. Those traditions stay in Cuba with a great sense of purity. You, you can go to other islands and you, and you see there is a, a still a, mm-hmm. a sense of Africa or a, a African tradition, but not like in Cuba that is so pure. But I say purity and impurity, because what um, uh, Terry said that it, it got mixed. We got music from so many places, and it got mixed. So it's hard to find something purely from the Congo or some or from uh, Nigeria. It's all mixed. But now, when you listen to any music now, whether it's a jazz number 
or uh, something for for the masses, something like to dance in a party, there will always be a section that is totally afloid. Uh, yes. <laughs> and uh, if if just if it doesn't have that, something is lacking in the in the in the mix in the mix. So I just wanted to add that part. Thank you. And before we move on to the next questions and um, turn the microphone to the audience, I would like to ask you. Um, make a comment first and then the question will come up from there um, about art as an instrument of transformation because I think you the three of you believe on that the power of the music as an instrument of transformation and so many different levels and the the power of the music that goes beyond mm -hmm. walls and different barriers so if you can um, expand in, in that sense and as an educator, as a music, as an artist, as a cultural ambassador, because I would say that. Um, how do you manifest that? How you work on that? Well, this is something uh, with, with that is really relevant and important to artists in general, and especially given the nature of music. And even when you go back to the first musicians, you can see how mobile they were, how important was for them, and also it was because of work uh, opportunities. They have to be moving in between countries. They have to start uh, traveling, not only ac across different geographies, but they have to learn how to communicate in different, in different parts of the world where they are. You can go back to Mozart, see when she go to Italy, he learns the Italian opera. He needs to write, learn how to write that uh, opera in the Italian style. But then he goes to France. He learned the same. He learned how to treat it as a as a French and as a German. But it's also you can see it here in, in cases like Duke Ellington and Louis Armstrong, who were ambassadors uh, of the you know of jazz and uh, in the world. Something that was really uh, important for me growing up. It was the teaching of my own father, being a musician, and also having the opportunity, the special opportunity to play in places where Cuban didn't even have political relationship with those countries at the time. And music was the way in which Cuba established relationship with those countries. So he instilled in us, again, mm -hmm. uh, at very early age, the importance to understand arts and music as an ambassador, and also to to, to understand the mission that we have as an artist, to erase and also it not only erase barriers and, and 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 barriers that can make us can can uh, can create differences, but at the same time to to see ourselves as someone that is an ambassador that has to really establish connection that has to really foster relationship that has to need, we need to foster collaboration yeah. so it's with that idea that uh, in uh, that you know we, we grew up in my house because it was practiced from from my father in, 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 in actually in the house mm -hmm. uh, I haven't had the opportunity to, to bring the students to Cuba but that's something that uh, will be so enriching for them to see. And to the list is really, I don't see any reason why should that barrier be there. So I'm very, I'm not gonna uh, talk a lot about that, but I'm glad that now there is this big opportunity for the exchange between both cultures to happen with more freedom. Mm -hmm. And um, I just hope that it remains that way for a long time. It's really, the, 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 it's very limiting for the people to not be able to share their traditions and empower their roots by learning what is done on the other. There are actually more similarities than there are uh, differences. So I, I, I'm totally pro that. Yeah, I I want to add that uh, I've been, as Giovanni, my brother, as Giovanni said, uh, one of the reasons I wanted to take music as a profession from the beginning was because all the tales of my dad of traveling and how he saw the world uh, through the music. He was able to visit many places in Africa, in the Eastern European uh, places uh, where, he, brought, where he, he went and performed. And uh, I've been able to, sing with the music, I've been able to see a lot of the world. 
and I've been able to teach uh, also abroad. I was teaching in India for six weeks in a university over there. And it's really enriching to see how uh, they, the, the students over there were so eager to learn the music. And at the same time, I was learning with them, trying to learn a little bit of their culture. And that's information and that's a way of like really getting to know each other and uh, what's really uh, important, not just for itself, uh, but uh, also for everyone involved in that change. Uh, I was telling about my culture, about how we play certain things because it's related to certain dynamic in the in the in, in our culture, and they explained to me uh, explained to me something similar how you know in the music this had to it, it deal with this other aspect of the culture, um, and also how the music is uh, uh, loved by many people in a, you know like the, the charanga style, for example, in Africa. When you go to Africa playing charanga, I don't know if you guys heard of charanga, charanga style music with violins and piano and flute and uh, was really prevalent, uh, 40s, 50s, 30s, 40s, 50s. Uh, that's a tradition that kind of stay frozen over there in Africa. You, you go to Senegal, you go to some of those places, like they revere you uh, playing that music. The same when you, when you go to Colombia as well. Um, I think it, yeah, it, it, it brings down uh, the barriers, as they said, and bring us closer to each other, and it's, it's really important for all of us to, to feel that, uh, to have that experience. Thank you. Also, I wanted to uh, give you a, 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 a anecdote. Last year, I had the opportunity to take the Harvard Jazz Band on a trip to Cuba, and we spent there one week. And during that week, I organized all of the activities uh, throughout the tour. We visited three music conservatories and we exchanged with them. They played for us, we played for them. I uh, arranged to have uh, one of the important uh, music coach to work with the band. Uh, I took them also into Matanzas to visit even like muse museums that they have a lot of remnants of the slavery. They saw Los Muñequitos de Matanza, one of the big authorities uh, in, in, in some of the Afri uh, Afro-Cuban music tradition that is still prevailing in Matanzas. And um, we did a concert with special guests and professional musicians from Cuba, Casa de las Americas. And um, the most uh, amazing part of the trip it was at the end to see uh, the power of transformation that music and art has in them, in all of the students. So they went into Cuba, not even with the concept of what Cuba was. And I made sure before we went on tour to bring different professors at the university to lecture them about where they were going. They talked about politics, they talked about history, they talked about everything. But nothing that they, they I mean, none of those lectures prepared them to the reality of being in contact with the culture. And um, so that was a truly transformative um, experience for the students. I mean, they, they were changed, I believe, for the rest of their life. So um, again, this is just like a, a little anecdote, the power of transformation that music and art have. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we're going to um, ask, take questions from the audience. And um, before that, thank you very much. Please uh, join me to thank you. Yes, we are ready to take some questions. Yes. So my question is kind of two part. Uh, the first part of the question is, um, I know that like in Afro-Cuban religion, certain rhythms are sacred. Can you incorporate those sacred rhythms into jazz or something if you are not attracted? And the second part of my question is, in two weeks I'll be in Havana, I'm very excited. <laughs> I've been five years in Miami and knowing about that Havana. Um, is there one place that you could uh, recommend that I would go to hear the best Cuban jazz? Mm. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, uh, the, there are many sacred things about the Afro-Cuban religions, 
but none of I, I think the rhythms are used. The I think what um, what they pray is what cannot be said. But the rhythm itself, yeah, it can be used in you know, mm -hmm. almost any genre. Or certain instrument cannot be used, um, but the rhythm itself, they permeate everything. everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, and also it's important to understand that uh, life is not separated from, 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 from the daily experience. Meaning like the practitioners are also the musicians that are part of the popular band mm -hmm. and are also the musicians that went to the classical music conservatories, are the composers, are everyone. So it's impossible that if I'm a, a, a practitioner, that I'm not going to use something that for me has a lot of importance. So, like as just expanding mm -hmm. on what Adonis said, um, you can use it. Uh, of course, there is. Uh, it also happens. Looking in the other side of the spectrum, it ha appropriation happen also there. People that are not practitioner that also use those uh, musical tradition for different purposes, you know. Uh, but yeah, there is no, there is no. I would say limitation, uh, and especially because when you are, it all depends on the mission and the impor and and what the 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 result of what you're using it for. Uh, I could give you the example. Of, uh, there was a CD that I, I I created, and the name is New Throne King, in which the entire CD is based on the musical tradition that came from the old kingdom of Dahomey, which is nowadays Benin. Um, Yes, I use everything from the from the that I've learned from from this type of uh, from this culture. But at the same time, to me, it's not a religious record. It's a cultural record. So therefore, it is in one that context that we're working with all of this. This is this vast heritage that came from West Africa. Yeah. I know. Just pounding on that. Of course, you could also find some close-minded people that might say, oh, you should be really using that. Yeah. But you're using it out of context. You don't use it within the, you know, the religious aspect of it. So it would definitely have a completely different, like if you, if you listen to the recording of Chalo Poso, what he was doing and stuff like this, he started to, to chant some uh, Abakwa uh, songs that nobody had ever put outside the, the the society, but you know, we listen now to, and it's completely normal now to be able to use those songs. But at the time when he was doing it, it was something completely new. But he was doing it so out of context. He was doing playing with DC. It was at the Carnegie Hall. It was a completely different. You know, it's one thing to be. You know, so it's it's accepted to use it. You know. And uh, talking about the places you go, I would say. La Sorre Acuerdo is one of the known places for years. Uh, it's, it's a club, La Sorre Acuerdo. The, the Fox on the, the Crow. Fox on the Crow. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that would be one of them to go, to, to go and see live music. I would say if you're there on Sunday, don't miss the Cajon Hamel. Uh, it's a Fumba experience on the street that is every, every Sunday, and it's really in the neighborhood with people in the neighborhood playing it. And it's an, an amazing experience that I would say something not to miss if you go there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, for sure. <laughs> no. um, any other questions from the audience? Yes. Uh, it's in Cuba. The music is falling off like this in America here. You know, like jazz and all that. Uh -huh. You know, uh, jazz used to be real popular. You know, you were speaking about this job. Mm hmm. In his mouth. Uh, a lot of that music, a lot of the youth is not into the music. Mm -hmm. You know, back during those days, you know, mm -hmm. seemed like falling off here. Yeah. Falling off like that in Cuba with the youth? I think it's, we're talking about two things that are really interesting because music at one point here was pop music here. Jazz was pop. Jazz was pop. You know, uh, I could always, I, I always made the, comparison like Ella Fitzgerald was like Beyonce or something <laughs> at the time. You know, was listening and the radio was on the on the T V was like a really popular. So um Nat King Cole. Nat King Cole, Nat King Cole one of them too was on television all the time performing and influenced many people. 
we don't have that anymore here. Uh, it's different uh, to a certain degree. It's harder to see. It's a little more expensive for the uh, younger generation to to be to have access to it. I think that that's, that makes it a little a little more far to to a little sad, for the farther away for them to 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 have a, a appreciation for it if they don't see it closely every day. Um, we could talk about many other things. Uh, I could say in Cuba, um, just still, it's like anything. Um, now we, we're generation, we've been here for a few years now. Uh, there's a, a, a generation of people now that is more into like whatever is uh, really popular right now. There's people doing reggaeton that for me it's like a completely different uh, type of music that maybe I'm not into it at the moment, but maybe. Hopefully, I don't get into it, but <laughs> you never know. Um, um, that's what's popular over there. There's a lot of people doing it because it's maybe catchy because I sort of somehow could make money quick. I remember at the time when we were over there, we were listening to more more jazz because there was groups that were included in their music that was more prominent, like in Hela Banda, Irakere. There were groups that were really like a, the, the top group at the time that were diffusing it more. So. We grew up in a generation in Cuba that had more jazz, like every day seeing it. Um, maybe they, like I said, the kids now they're seeing less because some of the reggaeton hit the country so strongly that it, they just follow whatever is popular at the moment. It's still, but if you still you go there, there's an amazing uh, players over there, young players. I don't think it's dying now. I think uh, it's different. Uh, different. It's just different. But it's a lot of great players. When you go over there, the jazz festival is in. Sometime in December, sometime in January, that's a, it's a, a, a lot of music and a lot of great players. You get to see it. It's a great show. I, mean, I have so many questions for you, but I really just love to hear what you're talking about. So if you could play something, right here. Oh. Yeah. 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 yeah, something. And also, we're gonna play something. Why don't you play something? No, no, no. Something. Oh. Yeah. Uh, uh, we're trying to figure out what. Yeah. <laughs> It was too early to bring to wake up the saxophone and the bass. So instead I brought the this instrument. Could you talk about the briefly? Mm. Uh, yeah. yeah, this instrument uh, is named checker. Uh, um, the tradition that my father learned it from, it was coming from the, the Yoruba kingdom from Nigeria. Uh, he learned with his uncle, but then he developed, he developed uh, his own technique and um, He's now considered like the king of this instrument in Cuba. He's even, he's, uh, he had even traveled back to Nigeria and back to different, more than 20 African countries which have played the instrument. And even they're, they're, uh, they're really impressed the way that he plays the And uh, yeah, the instrument has different names, chekere, agwe, agwe. And it's just a gourd that is dressed with a net of beads in the upside. This side, the, the net can change depending where you you get it. If you, in Africa, they sell it with, with they dress with cowrie shells. Uh, in Cuba, we use different a seed called mate mm -hmm. uh, that is red or black, mm -hmm. and that's how you use it. The how you dress it. And nowadays, a lot of people are using beads, plastic beads, or even sometimes uh, glass beads. So, as I said, the gourd grows in, in, in many different places. This gourd is actually from North Carolina, or South Carolina, because it grows here in the United States as well. And uh, this statement is very deceiving. It's like, I can give it to you, and it will be hard for you to get something out of it. But um, yes, let's listen to it in class, because I'm going to play. What well, time do you think you Something that we, that we that can, we can play. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh,
Ano, 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 this is an improvised concert. Uh, speaking of African traditions, this uh, piece that I'm going to play is called Dance of Yanigos, which is one of the religious uh, groups in Cuba. By? By the next <laughs> This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.